Yeah, I I should have allowed it. Oh, you did. Yeah. All good. We're going. We're live. What are you saying about talking on a podcast? Well, I mean, it gives you a sense of how you speak. And you, you may think it's very clear or very concise or you don't say the word like all the time. But then you go back and you hear it and you're, you are saying to yourself, man, I, I really have to learn how to speak, I think. <laughs> have you noticed, I noticed that this this morning when I was talking to a patient, I was evaluating what I was saying almost as I was saying it. And I was like, this isn't making any sense, John. You need to wrap this up or find a way to fix it. And I'm still going. I'm like, because if external rotation is, and I was just like, oh, you got to stop, John. You got to wrap it up. Wrap it up. I've been watching uh, 30 Rock again. Shut it down. Shut it down. When anything's wrong, shut it down. Shut it down. Uh, But no, um, do you have, did you have, have you had any patience with groins lately? I actually haven't, unfortunately. Not not for a few weeks or so. Yeah. Soccer player for the Americans. Soccer player. Um, but no, how about you? Yeah, I've had a couple of them come through recently. Nothing really exciting. Um, just enough to be like, oh, yeah, I forgot about groins, mm-hmm. adductors, and I think about adductors quite often, in, at least in treatment. Uh, treatment planning or in describing a treatment plan, but I don't think I've specifically dealt with a lot of adductor pain, groin pain, as it were. Um, your soccer play, was it just a kind of a groin strain, kind of just going down the leg? Because the reason I say that, I mean, that's obviously an adductor or groin strain, but uh we kind of have to, I guess, distinguish the couple different kinds, right? I mean, how would you distinguish between a hip flexor iliopsoas strain versus an adductor strain? Um, I think hopefully people would be pretty clear on what an inguinal, you know, that's palpation, you're gonna kind of determine that. Uh, But what are the ways you would sort of weed out I feel like a lot of them are obvious, but I feel like a lot of times because we think it's so obvious, we just kind of bypass it. But what are some of the ways that you would weed out the couple? There are really only three or four really different types of groin strays. How how would you weed those out? Yeah, well, I I think through the history, first of all. And I mean, I, I went and looked at some just kind of like review of the literature on groin strains just in preparation for the podcast. And it kind of makes sense. You're kind of like nodding your head a bit when you read it. And then some stuff you're, it's like, oh, it's good that we go back and reread this stuff and remind ourselves of, you know, for me, I kind of knew the adductor longus is by far the most injured groin muscle. If we're talking about an adduction strain, basically, but I didn't really know why, at least off the top of my head, why is it? I mean, I know the adductor longus is the one that's usually injured. I just know that inherently through clinical experience but um, why is it that one why why not the brevis why not the magnus why not a pectineus you know why not some of these other adductor groups why do they not strain as much and at least what i came across was that the is a very low tendon to muscle ratio of the adductor longus comparatively so it seems like the strength of that muscular tendinous junction is weaker because of this low tendon to muscle ratio. And I mean, almost all, all muscle strains are not going to be intramuscular strains. They're going to be musculotendinous strains. So right where the tendon meets the muscle, or sometimes they're tenoperiosteal, which would be at the bone, but there's a lot more rare and those are usually more of a struggle. So you think of like a high hamstring strain right at the butt bone versus what's way more common, which would be that kind of musculotendinous junction down the thigh a little ways. So, so anyway, that was some interesting like reminder of why it's the adductor longus in particular. But I think, I think it's something like in the range, yeah, 62 to 90% of all cases of adductor pulls or strains are of the adductor longus. So 
uh, and, and again, so just just to clarify, because you said a lot of good stuff really quickly. Uh, you said muscle to tendon ratio. Um, more tendon, more muscle. There's more muscle in that, I, I assume, is what you're. Yeah, low tendon to muscle ratio. Low tendon to got it. I got it. Yeah. More so muscle if it was muscle. if it was one to one, they'd be equal. So as it goes one to three, one to five, one to seven, you know, you're getting more and more muscle to tendon ratio. So I think it that musculotendinous junction just doesn't have as much pliability, but yet strength at the same time to handle some of these eccentric uh, strains or often this concentric eccentric activity at the same time, like where you're kicking a football, but then you accidentally contact the person's leg or sorry, soccer ball, whatever you want to call it. But you hit the soccer ball expecting to hit something that's, you know, a few hundred grams or a pound and you end up hitting a human and that's a large eccentric moment on a concentric activity, which can strain that musculotendinous junction, for example. It's either that or rapid movements tend to be the cause of, uh, of adductor strains. Uh, and I think it was more in an abducted or extended, and ex especially abducted in an external rotation position and then requiring a fast movement. I mean, I have a history of a couple groin strains from throwing the discus in university. Uh, and so, and, and mine matched up with that. If it was basically spinning out of the back of the circle, my leg goes into external rotation and abduction, and then I have to whip it fast through the circle. So it's almost like you're kicking your leg out like a sidekick, and then you're sweeping it all the way back through across your body, like an, like you're adducting that leg all the way across your body, like a step over but a very fast change of direction. So the leg kicks out and then it sweeps back across your body. And, and it, I heard it, but I had, I had the, the national championships coming up in just a couple of weeks. So I kind of tweaked it a few times trying to get through that whole situation. And then I also tweaked it again, doing some like uh, football combine tryout stuff, doing the 40 yard dash, which is, <laughs> Unfortunately, I had to do kind of in that same predicament. And, and, and this, this papers that I'm reading really was trying to emphasize that these injuries, if they go from being acute to chronic, can be devastating. And the paper was really trying to emphasize, be very careful on return to play, return to sport with adductor injuries, because if they, if they restrain it, like yours truly here, it's the, it just compounds immensely. And it's talking about sometimes it can put the whole person's career in jeopardy. So if you're taking care of somebody with a groin strain and you just, you know, you want to look good, you get them back to sport right away, their pain's kind of gone, you send them back in there and they strain it again. You know, you're not just dealing with an acute strain anymore. Now you're, if it, once it becomes chronic, you're also got to fend off tendinopathy. You got to fend off a bunch of new patterns that might be setting in and compensations and that once that tendon is no longer what it used to be and we know the research on tendinopathy is that tendinopathies don't really heal when you when you fix a tendinopathy you don't fill in the damage you just strengthen the healthy tendon around it so it's it's this idea of like you strengthen the donut you don't fill in the hole of the donut when you have a tendinopathy so and there's not much tendon. We just talked about this low tendon to muscle ratio. So if you're compromised a tendon and you end up with tendinopathy over time and adaptive changes and adaptive shortening or adaptive uh, complications, you may be putting your athlete in you know, a rough situation and doing a lot more harm than you might think. So it, it really made me stop and think twice about that return to play idea and being being cautious, and I, I am pretty cautious with hamstrings because they have such a high uh, reoccurrence. And with my football players, I'm always kind of saying, yeah, you can play this game, or and you might have a chance of hurting it and you're out for, for five games, or you could skip this game and be back the following game, you know, and play for the rest of the season. So, uh, but this was a good reminder for me to just to do that, and it, it matched up with my own experience. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Those just I feel like those smaller muscle groups are just a bit more fragile and, and prone to kind of go back to that thing. I, I haven't had any particularly horrible groin strains, uh, but uh, playing 
playing soccer in university, so many footballers out there. I mean, a lot of a lot of it happened exactly like you said. You're pivoting, you kick, a player's foot gets in the way, you, ca- you catch the ground from a shove. Mm. Uh, a lot of times you're playing defense, it's an outstretched leg, right? Mm. And then there's just a little bit of extra force put into it. Um, one of the – the um, what are the ways – I mean – one of the things I'm sure you've read in your uh, reviews are like the Copenhagen adduction is mm-hmm. one of the kind of the way to make this kind of more resilient. Uh, if you're in pain, it's, it's really not a, probably a good idea actually. Uh, but I see a lot of, a lot of footballers out there holding their buddies, you know, inner, uh, you know, inner thigh and uh, ankle while they do this Copenhagen abduction uh, exercise. It's a great exercise. I feel like the adductors, and correct me if I'm wrong, are kind of fall into the group like where we would consider like the rhomboids or an anterior tib, just a group of muscles that are just generally uh, people don't really address um, and kind of, you know, in off season kind of need to prepare, even if they, especially if they haven't had uh, any problems. What, so moving on to a little bit more of the treatment side. Well, let's actually – to differentiate, I mean, obviously the longest is one of the things, uh, history, where the pain is, obviously, some of the testing. Um, any kind of tests that you kind of rely on for uh, adductor strains? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, they're not too complex. I mean, sometimes I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll basically play with the leg with adductor or basically resisted strength tests in various positions and also various uh, positions of the knee. So if it's a straight leg, you might get some, ad- some longer adductors involved with a bent knee. You might have a little bit more influence of the shorter adductors or putting them in, you know, biasing the hip in flexion or putting the hip a little bit more extension. Just look up the origin and insertions of some of these muscles and put them a, a little bit in different positions based on their origin insertion and, and then apply a resistance in the opposing direction of, of the stretch and see if you don't get some irritation. I also feel like these groins don't really respond well to being forced to, uh, they don't like to be stretched if they're injured, but they also don't like to contract in a shortened position often. So like if you put a football or soccer ball between their ankles and have them squeeze it, just laying flat on the, on the bench uh, or on the table in your room, uh, that'll often elicit a pretty pinpoint area you could also put it between their knees if that helps elicit the pain a little bit more they they often will can pretty much pinpoint you know uh they don't know where their adductor longus is but they'll put their finger right on the musculotendinous junction of the adductor longus pretty much especially when you start to apply these resisted muscle uh tests that that really just give them a pretty small area where they point that would be different than what john already brought up about you know athletic pubalgia or some of these athletic um, hernia, sports hernia type of issues where that's a little more complicated. They could even have testicular pain. They could have pain up the inguinal ligament above the inguinal line. If you're getting stuff going up in there, yeah, we have other things we can think about. Uh, Soas strains and rectus femoris strains. Uh, Again, just strain of the actual inguinal ligament and canal itself, more of like an athletic uh, hernia, sports hernia, and often those things go together, believe it or not. And it actually supports that in the literature where there's concomitant, uh, basically sports hernia with an adductor strain. And that, that basically highlights this importance of, uh, either over dominance on one side where that adductor is strong, but also the abdominals are strong. And, but maybe the opposite side is not the case, or you could have this shearing activity going on this this competition between maybe a strong adductor and and a weak abdominals or or vice or vice versa flipping it the other way strong abdominals and a weak adductor Uh, i mean i'll let it go back to you on this but i mean just to go back to your copenhagen plank there's there was research done on rugby players and also nhl players that really support this idea that you shouldn't have especially as an athlete an, an adduction strength of, of less than 80% of your abduction strength. And I mean, they implemented some protocols to remedy that with like astronomical results, basically just 
decreased injuries massively. It was not a small percentage. I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but it's it's quite a big deal um, just by remedying that. So it does show. So you, you you're, say, you're, you're saying the difference between adductor and abductor strength increase. So increasing abductor strength. No, if you're if your abduct if your adduction strength is less than 80% as strong as your abduction strength, huh. you are, uh, I think it's 18 times. <laughs> I think more, I know the one you're talking likely about. likely to sustain yeah. an adduction injury. 17 or 18 times more likely. Right. That, that might have been on rugby players, but there's also NHL studies to support this as far as, I think they took that study and then they said, okay, let's look at this. They implement adduction strength program. And then they saw the correlation of injuries from the previous season just drop tremendously by, by making sure all their players had this, at least this 80% uh, of their abduction strength. Because I mean, when you think about a sport like hockey, that's pushing side to side. They probably have great abduction strength. Um, speed skaters, hockey players, even, you know, basketball players and, and, and soccer players a lot because they're cutting and they're side to side, move their frontal plane activity. But if they get, yeah, for whatever reason, if those adductors drop off in, in relative strength, we get issues. So I understand that, make, that makes a lot of sense. They just are generally a, a weaker kind of group. It, it seems obviously if you're going to do a study like that and juice them up. Uh, one of the things in terms of obviously strengthening up them, strengthening them up to prevent injury. Uh, but we've kind of talked about this in previous episodes. Um, the compressive forces on one side need to be kind of expansive on the opposite side, right? So even if you are going to compress and use those adductor muscles, you still need oppositional uh, compression or expansion on the, the outside of the hip as well. Uh, another important strategy just to give a little bit more wiggle room to that hip, right? Um, the other question I, I kind of had, so, so when you go for a treatment thing, let's just say we're not doing brutal manual therapy. Uh, maybe, maybe we are, maybe, you know, just some light foam rolling, things like that do help, you know, especially if you're an athlete, you can usually feel that rather quickly. If something is done to your body, like a Theragun, you're like, Oh, that made a difference. Then maybe not, that's not a complete treatment plan. Um, what, what, what are your kind of general, your general direction when treating sort of a, a, a general adductor strain? Well, I want you to explain more about that compression decompression for our listeners, uh, but, but before that sure, I'll, I'll answer, sure. I think, I think definitely, I would I wouldn't worry so much so much about the people that don't pl- apply enough passive modalities. I feel like if if anything we're too biased towards it's passive modalities on something like an an adductor strain. Let's ice it, let's rest it, let's massage it, let's theragun it, let's cup it, let's needle it. Let's do everything we can until that pain's gone and then I'll tell you that you're good and I'll discharge you. And that's what I'm worried about because that's where those reoccurrence, those injuries come back because the only way that, that, that tissue comes even close to back to its original form is through load, right? This is force is the language of cells. This is Andre Ospina, right? He loves that line. And I I can't, I can't find a way to refute that. This is just histology, the stuff that we all slept through in, in Cairo school and PT school that didn't matter. Right. But that, but that, that tendon loading, that muscular loading is the only way we can rebuild this. And, and it's fascinating because when we look at Achilles tendons and, and patellar tendons and they find out you can rehab these things and pain goes away and you can be strong again and you could squat a ton, they look at it, that tendinopathy is still there, but you're still able to build such a ro- robust tendon around it that you can handle these loads again. So it's, it's, it's okay. If, I mean, if you're just going to play call of duty professionally, I think you can just apply a bunch of passive modalities till that groin strain goes down and they're fine. And you know what? They're probably not going to have an adductor strain again, but, and I, I'm going to let John go. I, I want to hear John explain how, even if they're not going to play football again, high level NHL again, how an adductor strain that's not treated properly, that leads to adaptive shortening or tightening or, compression or tightness on that side left alone doesn't necessarily yield more adductor strains because they quit sports 
but what else can it yield? I mean, what other influences it can have that you have a, a, a change in that adduct or whatever one that's a problem and not letting you do what? Like what other, you know, what's the sequelae of this, of, of this injury? Yeah, I think a good way to answer that question, what, how that injury could perpetuate itself uh, secretly, if you would, behind the scenes. And let's just say, yeah, you're, you're a normal desk jockey and you got out this spring and you were pulling some weeds and, you know, you reached out a little bit and just kind of pulled your groin a little bit. Maybe you didn't even address it because it wasn't that bad. Um, and I, I actually, I think the best way to answer this would be kind of with a patient. I have a patient in a uh, wonderful young lady. She's a teacher. She's been a teacher for 20, 30 years now, middle school teacher, super sweet lady. Uh, has a really bad groin pain and pull on her right groin. Hmm. So bad that uh, kind of even trying to test it, doing, you know, shear tests or just kind of your general muscle resistance, hip flexor, iliopsoas resistance tests. I, we did it for a second and she was jumping off of the table, right? Like it, you, I couldn't really do much by that way. And so um, in terms of being able to treat her, I was only looking at treating agonists and antagonists of that right groin because we honestly couldn't put my hands on those, that adductor group or really get much movement in her right femur, her right leg at all without her, ju- you know, without her screaming bloody murder. So I have two questions. One would be, what is her history of injury of the leg or of the thigh? And the second question would be, are, is, she, is she also exhibiting like capsular pattern of the hip at this point where in flexion, she's getting anterior impingement and she has no internal rotation, et cetera? She's, she's not exhibiting too many capsular patterns, but I don't know if we can't even tell that because she was so incredibly guarded. Like we can't even get her to flex that much. So I guess you could say, yes, it's a kind of, a positive or even false positive. Mm. Uh, and, and in subsequent visits, I did find out, yeah, that is the case. Uh, she doesn't have, she can't access her posterior inferior capsule on that right side either. Mm. Uh, her history also was such that we had, she had some right low back pain, right SI pain that would kind of shoot into the glute. And uh, this is maybe a good year ago or so. Um, but again, she's not incredibly active, but yeah. She has multiple, multiple or a single adductor strain, or does she never have a traumatic adductor strain? She, she's never had this adductor strain before. Um, and it is, it is locked up. It is just locked up. So my options are kind of limited after going after the tendon, going after the muscle. I don't use Theraguns or, or cupping, God bless. But even if I did, she, she, would, she would cry in pain if we did that. So, so you're thinking neurology at this point. Right. Or neuro inhibition. Neuro inhibition. You could think of PNF. You could I'm trying to find what are the, what are those, what are her neighbors that I could I could fire up or turn off or turn on to help that right groin group of muscles kind of relax. And at first I just kept it pretty simple. We just went straight over to her left groin. We tried to position her hip in such a way that her left adductor group would be able to fire. And that actually got her, we got her to be able to touch her toes kind of with that. Just right adductor group is going crazy. Fire up the left adductor group and you get some kind of balance in the middle. So that's the Um, assumption that basically spasm on that right side, that activity coming off of that right side is holding her pelvis basically on towards that side. So by turning on her left ones, we get a little shift away from the right leg or from the right femur. Correct. And so this is another thing I tried to, in my head, I I believe I've mentioned this before and I could probably explain it better. But if we were to imagine a femur going into a pelvis, right? That if the pelvis was perfectly still, that femur could abduct and adduct, right? Conversely, if that femur was perfectly still, and let's just keep it very simple, that pelvis, that ilium could adduct and abduct, right? Mm -hmm. So I understand those two things. I I don't think I can move her femur on this side. However, I understand going the opposite way. If I understand that on her right side, we're just going to imagine that her femur is adducted and that 
for her ilium is also abducted and they're both kind of come together basically right mm -hmm. and they won't let go so i need to get that exact same thing to happen on the other side to undo that right side if that makes any sense it's a pretty complicated people often it's hard to isolate femur pelvis pelvis femur mm -hmm. right but basically just trying to do the exact same thing on the opposite side which would allow that right side to calm down um and that gave her quite a bit of relief uh it, it wasn't everything but it gave her quite a bit of relief yeah, the second yeah, yeah, yeah. Go i was just kind of clarifying i think yeah, just in case you lost anybody i think the adduction of the femur would be abduction basically of the of the acetabulum for sure and then the the top part of the ilium would be adduction again it would be you know what i mean it's like the lower part of the os coxa yes. bone right, is, right, right. is is tipping with the acetabulum outward into abduction so it, but anybody who just wants to stand up and play with shifting their hips you know what i mean uh shifting laterally into like a right hip and adducting their their leg will will feel this what john's talking about i need one of those kind of dummy uh things that we have in school to kind of move that around it's it's not a simple concept no. but those actions should happen concomitantly they should happen at the same time in the normal gait cycle, the exact opposite should happen on the other side. Mm -hmm. So if I am assuming where the right side is, I can assume that the left side is in the opposite. Yeah. It's not guaranteed, of course. I'm just assuming. But because with this case, she is so stuck in right adduction that I, I, I mean, so stuck in right adduction. And this is not, it's not this cut and dry. This poor lady was just clearly there that I could just assume the left side was the opposite of what the right was. Yeah. And if anybody's really like, what the hell, <laughs> just stand up in a neutral anatomical position, feet apart a little bit, and then just shift your hips one direction and hold it there. So if John goes to that side, whichever side he shifted to right there, that one side is adducted and the other side is abducted. So you don't even have to think about who cares what the LEM is doing, but in other words, if, if he shifts his pelvis over like he showed, and you stand, if you stand there and you just shift your hip over to one side, like people stand on one leg, you've got one hip in adduction, you have one hip in abduction. That's all John's talking about. So if he says, I'm going to shift her to the other side, so he's going to get the left hip to go into adduction and the right hip to go into abduction, which would, and he's, he's not going to be able to get that by just cranking on the adductor. At least that's what he's trying to say. So the option would be, how can we use other musculature, other friends and families, if I'm saying all this right for John, to shift him, to shift that, that lady out of that position to the other side, which would just give some relief to that right adductor. Yeah, we're going to add some videos, obviously, to this YouTube one. But if you're listening on the podcast, think about a, a groin stretch, a general groin stretch. Your legs are apart. You shift your weight over to the right or you shift your weight over to the left. That's essentially what I'm a, a gross idea of what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But anyways, yeah, the friends and family, the, the other friends and there are friends and family there on the right side as well. So once we got that to calm down and a lot of people go exactly right to the, the glute med and glute minimus, uh, anterior glute med is a really good one. And it, this also goes with the compressive strategies or the expansive strategies, right? So if that, and this is the easiest way that I like to think about it is our friend Bill Hartman talks about a slinky, right? Imagine a slinky unfolding as it goes down the stairs, right? One side will compress and the other side needs to expand. So I know that if her right groin is 100% it's compressed, that those right adductors are compressed, she does not have expansion on that right lateral hip. Hmm. right because it's all compressed there and that that is where that slinky cannot go you're just jamming the slinky down on one side and the other side will not then open up so uh i actually did try to do that first uh and i failed just so we're not giving examples on this podcast of all the gold stars that my tr patients treated yeah. uh i tried to 
and, and and it's one way, especially I like to do that with like right SI pain, right low back pain, specifically right low back pain. I know that there's no lateral excursion, if you will. That slinky is not opening up on the right side like it needs to through that right posterior and lateral hip. And so sometimes I can get some right posterior lateral hip expansion and the right QL will relax or right SI will really pain will really calm down quickly. And so I've got a couple techniques to kind of go after that quickly. And I did do that. And I was very quickly told by her body that that was not the direction to go. In. <laughs> so I did fail miserably there, but we very quickly, you know, turned around and called on the left side family to kind of help us out. But that was my second move. And I went to some more kind of easier techniques for that right side expansion. But anytime you imagine that right groin is overly compressed, and this can work in a number of different scenarios throughout the body, it's a pretty simple one. There, you've, you're lacking some ex expansion. You're lacking a shape, as our friend uh, K-Star would say, mm -hmm. right? So that right lateral side is not expanding, and we need to kind of get that. Was that fair? Yeah, it's perfect. And if I can, if I can give a, another visual, if you think about, we have this right adductor that's locked up, well, just for simple terms, locked up, compressed. Just imagine you're doing the Anderson squat. We've already, I think it's the Anderson squat, right? Basically, you're, you're on a block on your, let's just say your right leg, like this lady. Just imagine this is this lady. She's standing on a, a block or a stair with her right leg, but her left, her left leg is almost, it's off the stair. So she's standing sideways on a stair on a staircase with her right foot on a stair and the left leg is down lower than the right one. The right leg is holding the body up. It's compressed. It's in adduction. This is what we should do when we were walking and we're on our right leg. So the person's walking, they get on their right leg in mid stance. We freeze the video. We look at them should be a right compressed hip should be a left expanded as to use John's terms or open, um, uh, Unco decompressed left hip that's how it can swing so to take this case and say i mean this is what i'm worried about with the cases maybe that don't resolve from pure strengthening as these research articles support which sounds great i i i completely believe that but what about those cases where they're strengthening they're trying you're trying to resolve them uh they are getting stronger but they still can't decompress the right side and and, and just think of it simply from a, from walking you walk, you get on your right leg, it's compressed, the left leg's decompressed, just so people aren't getting confused by this word compression. And you get on the left leg, it's, it's compressed, and the right leg decompresses. Now imagine the la this lady who seems like she, she can only compress on her right side. John can't even stretch that leg. He can't even lift the leg into abduction, I bet. He can't touch the adductor. So she's compressed, period. But she walks out of the office. Now when she's walking, she's, she's not going right side compression, left side compression, right side compression, left side compression. She's going right side compression, right side compression, right side compression, even though she's going right, left, right, left, right, left. Now, if you let that person, once they're pain free, go back onto the field or not even onto the field, just, I don't know, go to the, go to the, the box and do CrossFit, go to the local gym and run on the treadmill, do some box jumps, whatever they want to do. And then they keep re-injuring that, that uh, adductor group. This, I, I think this is this is the worry for the chronicity that I do have that that's not really supported so much by literature as it is from more anecdotal uh, and 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 other information that we have to believe where uh, and, and it makes kind of logical sense. But I just want people to picture this idea of walking. You can understand the compression and decompression and expansion. So um, if you can get this lady to be so to speak, compressed on her left side, that right side should be able to temporarily let go. Uh, yeah. And, and that was the main strategy, right? Because her right side was just so dang tender. And so like, once I kind of figured out what expand, you know, expansive and compressive strategies she's kind of going after, I have in my mind a list of places that I can either expand or can contract. Let's just keep it as if I can squeeze or I can try to loosen up. So what are, what are some of those? What are some things that, that, that either, yeah, contract or let go? So, yeah. And so we actually, once I kind of figured that out, what didn't work, what did work, once I find something that does work, 
I've got a pattern in my mind. So we got that her left adductors to compress. And then I got her right lateral hip to expand. And then we, because I know her history of a year ago, her right low back, we gave, we, we expanded also her right kind of back almost, almost from her QL up to her, her, her lats, right? We did a big expansion over on that right side. So if she is going to shift over onto the right, I know that she's, like you mentioned, she's going to compress through that right adductor, but I have to give her a couple options, honestly, because in, it's all, in all likelihood, you're right, she is gonna go use that. And so we gave left side compression, right low back, right lats, and then we tried to get a little bit of her left abdominal, almost obliques, transverse. We have a couple little tricks that we can do that, but once I get it, I'll do three or four of those in a row, um, and it was her first visit. So I called her later that evening and she was like, I think I'm going to go for a run. I feel great. I was wow. like, hold on friend, hold <laughs> on. And like, she was like, well, even just Pilates. And I was like, go to Pilates. You please be careful. I, I honestly I didn't have your study in mind. And I'm, that's why I, I love doing this podcast because I learned so much and hopefully you do too. But Absolutely. Uh, not you, the listeners, dude. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. Uh, but anyway, so she, she and she's like, I feel like I could run. So honestly, sometimes the body needs one extra outlet or two. And and I have been thinking in this way that once I kind of see those an, an agonist and antagonist relationships. And I know a couple quick strategies, especially if she's not hurting, like her low back wasn't hurting, her lats weren't hurting, her left abs and her left leg are fine. I can use those, maybe they're a little bit dysfunctional. I have enough strategies where in the half hour that I'm with her, we can give her three or four positive uh, alternatives, I'll say, rather than that right adductor compression. I got you. Yeah. And I think you said something earlier, something like a, a pseudo capsular pattern or a false capsular pot- pattern. I think that was something that you, you, you mentioned something like that. And, and that's, that's a good point because if, if you can get the right adductor to let go a bit, you may w- have what you thought is capsular pattern, which comes when a capsule is becoming too tight or we're getting Correct. a little agey in our hips. Right. But right. if an adductor is basically false, creating a false positive there, of, of a capsular pattern where that, you know, there's no internal rotation, no flexion, uh, and then no abduction. Well, it could be, but as soon as maybe by getting a little bit of a test can be, if you get that adductor group to, to be able to shut off and maybe be able to get them to shift left and right a little bit and compress and decompress, you might recheck something as simple as supine hip flexion, supine hip flexion and adduction, uh, like a cross body knee test. And if they start they don't really feel as much impingement in the, you know, in the front of the hip. Then the, and, and all of a sudden their IR, their IR starts coming back and they've gained 10 degrees magically of IR. I'd say you got, you've let that hip go a bit, especially in a young athlete where um, there probably wasn't a true capsular pattern underneath that. And then go after that Copenhagen blank, then go after, you know, the, getting that 80% ratio uh, of adductor to abduction strength which I completely believe is probably the way to get them back on the field. So, but if they're, if they're not able to compress and decompress, like as John has alluded to, I think the strength buys you time and it buys you some load tolerance, but it won't in the end be able to withstand, you know, a poor strategy of movement, which would be a a hip that's not acting like a hip. Right. And just one last kind of explanation. If the hip is not acting like a hip and they're lacking those other strategies, where did I, where did I pull those strategies out from? Right. Why did I say her right lats? Right. Why did I say her left abdominals compressing? And we can kind of argue with this and I'm sure Bobby can make some good points about it. There, there are some people who say that they don't believe in the frontal plane existing. But those are other frontal plane muscles, in other words, right, where her right groin, even if you're just kind of looking at uh, anatomy, right, her right groin and her left obliques would be opposite muscles, right? Mm -hmm. And furthermore, you could see from her left obliques to her right lats would also be 
op opposing musculature, right? So just very simply, that's kind of all I'm looking for. It is a little three-dimensional from the groin to the, to the abdomen, from the abdomen to the lats. It is a, it's not that crazy of a stretch, but those are frontal plane and kind of agonist muscles. And if you can get kind of a list of those in your head, I was just forced to because her right adductors were so shut off that we kind of had to go to those muscles. But I'm just thinking frontal plane muscles. I'm not just kind of pulling things out of the air, if that makes any sense. No, no. This is supported in multiple courses, literature, books like Anatomy Trains with spiral lines and front body lines and different stuff like that. So just, yeah, pick out a book and look at it and imagine <laughs> some of the stuff that, that John has uh, brought out for us tonight, which was pretty good stuff, I think. I wish I had some more adductor injuries to work on right now. I guess we have to have a part two when we both get a couple more good ones in the clinic and, and tell whether or not they turn out good or bad. We can, we can share them. Absolutely. And a uh, shout out to Deborah crushed at this podcast. I, uh, I appreciate you injuring your groin. <laughs> Way to go, Deb. All right, man. Awesome, dude. <laughs> All right. That was good. Yeah. Dude, look at us. Fucking shit. <laughs> <laughs> shit did i hit record oh i did i did good okay uh, i did anyway so we were safe. okay awesome cool man i'm gonna run down to austin yeah go get that was it, awesome that was awesome dude so, i'll talk to you later man we'll crush some stuff uh this weekend oh, woo! see you buddy <laughs> later <laughs>